Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Frank on the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight, our main focus will be Chinua Achebe, who died recently at the age of 82. Chinua Achebe was one of the great writers to come out of Africa. He is the Nigerian post-colonial novelist who wrote Things Fall Apart, which has sold 12 million copies and been an influence on politics and literature all over the world. Here is the BBC4's Matthew Bannister with the last word on Chinua Achebe. Chinua Achebe was the father of modern African literature. The Nigerian-born writer, poet and professor is best known for his first novel, Things Fall Apart, which was published in 1958. The novelist and academic Carol Phillips. I think it's probably the seminal book which explains the whole process of uh, colonization in Africa, the process by which uh, people's uh, country, their land, their rivers, their hills, their landscape, their names, were renamed and reclaimed by European intruders. Does white man understand our custom about land? How can he, when he does not even speak our tongue? But he says that our customs are bad and our own brothers who have taken up his religion also say that our customs are bad. The major issue of the time was the push for independence. So there was something in the air in Nigeria that was challenging the colonial condition. It's a novel set in the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, um, in which the white man, a clever white man, comes uh, quietly and peaceably with his religion and, in in a sense, fools the Africans. How do you think we can fight when our own brothers have turned against us? The white man is very clever. He came quietly and peaceably with his religion. We were amused at his foolishness and allowed him to stay. It's a story which I think stands as a parable or could be seen as a parable for a larger social movement which swept across the whole continent. I knew, for me, my strategy would not be to jump into... Uh, the the turmoil that was going on, but to go into the why it all happened in the first place. Why did my parents leave their religion and become Christians? I was far more interested in that angle of dealing with this story. Its great strength, of course, is that it's rooted in something in a very specific village, in a very specific time, and with extremely memorable uh, character. Oh yes, oh yes. I mean, he's a, a novelist who very much uh, wears his heart on his sleeve. I think as a writer of poetry, as a writer of essays, and in his fiction, uh, he draws very much on his own life, his own observations, his own feelings. Um, and I think that's one of the great strengths of his work. He is a modernist. I mean, I think this is one of the things that people miss about Achebe. He's a great stylist. He felt himself to be in conversation with the great Western writers. Uh, the very title of Things Fall Apart comes from Yeats, from a Yeats poem. Now he has won our brothers, and our clan can no longer act like one. He has put a knife on the things that held us together, and we have fallen apart. Chinua Achebe spent several years in the United States during the 1970s, when times were troubled in Nigeria. And he spent the last decades of his life there, not least because in 1990, like thousands in Nigeria, he fell victim to the horrendous danger of the country's traffic and was paralysed from the waist down. My son and I were travelling to Lagos and um, the car went out of control. I was asleep because I wasn't feeling very well. And um, apparently the calf then fell on me. I was unconscious. And the accident was so serious that it was decided to fly me out of Nigeria to, to Britain. 
I was sort of put together by the surgeons. I was in hospital for six months. They'd done all uh, they could and um, recommended America. Now, Achebe, for all his, his ferocity of vision, for all his surety with which he stepped forward and, and, and assumed the mantle, and I think quite rightly, as the, the father of modern African literature, behind all of this was a very gentle, very caring, noble man. I have come to say thank you. That's really the reason for my visit. I was quite taken aback, astonished by the kindly disposition of my people to me. You want to say, this is our brother, and that's what I want to say to, to you. You are my brothers and sisters. His loss is not just a great loss to African literature, it's a great loss to all literature in English, and it's a great loss to literature all over the world in whatever language it's written. I always miss Nigeria when I leave it. And that's very strange because it's a country full of stories. Here's Samir Rahim writing in The Telegraph, the first post-colonial writer, the father of the African novel, the greatest writer never to have won the Nobel Prize. All these descriptions have been applied to Nigeria's Chinua Achebe, who has died at the age of 82. Achebe, by the end of his life, was famous as much for what he represented as for what he had written, an emblem of a continent finding its voice, a literary Nelson Mandela. But in all the tributes, we must not forget one thing. Achebe was a novelist of genius whose works cannot be reduced to a single slogan or easy cause. His first novel, Things Fall Apart, published while he was a radio producer in Lagos, Nigeria, has sold 12 million copies, and there is a good case for it being the greatest post-war novel in English. The novel's title is taken from Yeats's The Second Coming. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. At the novel center is the village of Umufia and its strongest personality, Okonkwo. We see his life destroyed by a series of calamities, the most significant of which is the British arrival in Igbo land. He is impotent when his son abandons his tribal religion to attend a mission school. When it emerges that the British have brought not only a religion, but also a government and a queen, Okonkwo's refusal to compromise leads to his tragic end. What is most impressive about Things Fall Apart is its technique, the way time is measured, for example. At the novel's opening, the villagers look forward to two or three moons after the harvest or to hosting someone for three or four markets. The missionary's gradual encroachment brings an adjustment to the calendar. Near the end, the narrator starts speaking of the following Sunday. Though the British do not exactly come out well from things fall apart, the novel is far from an anti-colonial screed. Pre-colonial life is not idealized. Many Igbo are attracted to the Christians who save the twins cast in the forest by the Igbo and welcome anyone regardless of their status. Achebe, in his memoir, The Education of a British Protected Child, published three years ago, wrote warmly of the mission school he attended. Things Fall Apart is not just an African story. It has the universal resonance of a Greek tragedy with Okonkwo, the flawed hero. One detail casually mentioned near the start is telling. Okonkwo, the man of action, has a stutter. For all his bravado, he is vulnerable, and when his circumstances change, he stumbles and falls. Achebe's reputation rests on that book, but his others are prescient portrayals of post-colonial Nigeria. 1960s, No Longer at Ease, the title taken from T.S. Eliot, shows how a good man can be corrupted and then corrupt others. A man of the people portrays a military coup in a fictional country very similar to Nigeria. Soon after it was published, there was an actual coup in Nigeria. During the Biafran War from 1967 to 70, a southern province of Nigeria tried to become independent. Achebe supported their ultimately doomed cause. In his last book, A Personal History of Biafra, he wrote that one found a new spirit among the people, a spirit one did not know existed, a determination, in fact. The bloody conflict darkened his work. His poem, Vultures, imagined swollen corpse in a waterlogged trench, victims of the Nigerian army. Like all great writers, though, he was able to step back from his own distress. The same spirit of family and national spirit so that we so value might have also had the seed of evil within it. From the poem, Vultures. Praise bounteous providence, if you will, that grants even an ogre a tiny glowworm tenderness encapsulated in icy caverns of a cruel heart, or else despair, for in the very germ of that kindred love is lodged the perpetuity of evil. Following a car accident in 1990 that left him in a wheelchair, Achebe produced no fiction. In his most fertile years, though, his writing grappled with the largest questions and was told with beautiful lucidity. A friend of mine once told me he reread Things Fall Apart every year. 
I shall be following his example. That's Chinua Achebe, one of the great literary masters of the 20th century. We're going to move on now to two sports figures, both of whom were all-stars, played in championship games, and were a pride to their respective cities. The first is Virgil Fire Trucks, the great fastballing right-hander for the Detroit Tigers, who died recently at the age of 95. Virgil Trucks won the second game of the 1945 World Series against the Cubs. He was a two-time All-Star, known for his great fastball, but his place in history is secured in that he is only one of five people who threw two no-hitters in the same year. That was 1952. Ironically, it was the year he went 5-19 and had an ERA of almost 4. Imagine that two of his five wins were no-hitters. He was later traded to the White Sox, and he had a couple of good years with the White Sox. He was known for his mean disposition on the mound. He would back guys off all the time, but he was a fantastically nice guy and never refused an autograph off the field. And Ted Williams called him harder to hit than Bob Feller. And Skip Batten, the great songwriter who was part of the Birds and the Flying Burrito Brothers, and also Skip of Skip and Flip, mentioned Virgil Fire Trucks in his great immortal song about the St. Louis Browns. Here's one of the last interviews with Virgil Trucks from his home in Alabama, where he talks about the 45 World Series against the Cubs, his time in the service, and some of the great players and personages he met in the 40s and 50s in baseball. Yes, I pitched the second game of the World Series and won that one 4-1 to one with my good friend Hank Greenberg hitting a three-run home run. Then I had to start the sixth game, and it, I didn't finish that one. I went six and then was taken out. It was, that game went 13 innings, and... and Finally, the Cubs won in the 13th. Yeah, then beat the Cubs in Game 7 the next day. Hank Greenberg was a great ball player and a great guy. You couldn't find a better person to play ball with. Was an all-out type of ball player and, and was good. I mean, he had power. Of course, a big guy like he was, he's six foot six. He's, he didn't take any abuse from anybody. We had an Army-Navy World Series played in Honolulu at 44. We played the Army, which had Joe DiMaggio and uh, other major league players, but we had American League and National League players that played on the team with the Navy, and we beat them. Uh, we played them 13 games. We won 11, lost one, and tied one. Nimitz got in and decided to send us down into the South Pacific to play some games down there for the entertainment of the, the servicemen. So we went on a tour of about two weeks of playing there, and then we were dumped on Guam. Here he talks about some of the people he met in the later stages of his career. When he mentions Babe Ruth, he says he was with the White Sox, but that's not possible. He didn't go to the White Sox till 53. Babe Ruth died in 48. So he may have been talking about meeting Babe Ruth when he was at Comiskey Park while he was with the Tigers in the 40s. A lot of those baseball players, when they get old, they remember things different than they really were. Who is the best player you ever played with? I'd have to say Mickey Mantle, because I got to play with the Yankees in 58 to last year I played, and I'd say Man uh, Mantle was one of the greatest. Who was the toughest guy you ever faced? As to be Ted Williams, which I think is the greatest hitter that ever was and ever will be. But he had the greatest hand-eye coordination that any hitter I ever looked at. He never swung at a bad ball. I never ever once to see him swing at a bad ball. I met Ty Cobb and I met Babe Ruth. And when I was stationed at Great Lakes in boot camp, uh, Ty Cobb came up to, make, uh, to visit Mickey Cochran, who was the manager of Great Lakes Ball Club. And I got to meet him there and one other time in uh, California after the war. And he was a pretty decent sort of fellow. He didn't seem like the guy that was, he was accused of being, you know, hurting second baseman, sliding in, and a rough and rowdy ball player. He seemed like a very nice man. Babe Ruth was just as humble as a little kitten, and they got to know him pretty well. I met him when I was playing with the White Sox. He seemed to be in the White Sox ballpark all the time. He eat hot dogs. He'd probably eat three or four games. And uh, I never brought that up to him, but some of the guys who knew him real well mentioned it and told me about it. That was Virgil Trucks, the great fastballer from the Detroit Tigers. You listen to these podcasts, 
and you find accounts of ball players who played over a century ago. The second athlete is Harlan Hill, the great wide receiver for the Chicago Bears in the 1950s. Harlan Hill died recently at the age of 80, and he was a Texan, and he came out of the University of North Alabama, where his quarterback was somebody we did on a podcast last year, George Lindsay, who gained greater fame as Goober on the Andy Griffith Show. I should have mentioned that when we did Goober. He was the NFL's first rookie of the year, and in 1986, long after his career was over, Division II decided to name their Player of the Year trophy after Harlan Hill. It's still named the Harlan Hill Trophy today for the best Division II player every season. He was a several-time pro bowler known for his great hands and his fantastic speed. He played on the best Bears team in the 1950s, the 1956 team, which was a great team, but they were beaten soundly in the NFL championship game by the New York Giants, who also had a great team. Here's a little bit of another famous player, George Bland, who was the Bears quarterback at the time, throwing to Harlan Hill in the 1956 championship game. Brown's prime target, all-pro end Harlan Hill, obliges a still photographer with pregame pictures. This time, Bland goes back to throw. George passes over the middle to Harlan Hill, and it's good for an 18-yard gain as Hill moves to the giant 46. Time is running short on the Bears, and they have to pass. Here's that same plan of the Hill pattern. That game was a little before my time. I don't remember it, but I do remember when I was a little boy, I did know that Harlan Hill was on the Bears, and I heard him catch a couple of passes on the radio. By the way, in that game, there were a couple of other famous people. The Giants had a pretty fair flanker running back who you may have heard of. New Yorkers point with pride to their star, Frank Gifford, a 26-year-old, 205-pound halfback from Southern California. Gifford was the National Football League's most valuable player in 1956. The Giants flank Gifford to the left, and the speedy halfback races straight down the sideline. Connolly spots him open, and man, this combination is murder. Gifford, a gifted receiver, is also a guilt edge runner as he races away on a 67-yard play. He was playing in that game before Kathy Lee was born. The Giants' defensive coordinator in that game was a fellow named Tom Landry. We did Tom Landry last year, the great coach for the Dallas Cowboys. He didn't get a mention on the broadcast by Chris Schenkel, but if you listen real carefully, Chris made a brief mention of another guy on the Giants coaching staff who turned out to be the most famous of them all. After that big play, the Giants take time out, and Connolly comes over to the sideline for instructions from backfield coach Vince Lombardi. How's that? Tom Landry and Vince Lombardi on the same coaching staff for the Giants in the mid-50s. A decade later, they'd be coaching against each other with Lombardi on the sideline for the Packers and Landry on the sideline for the Cowboys. You can see the vapor of his breath in the cold air at the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field in the most famous football game ever played, the Ice Bowl. Back to Harland Hill, he retired. He had an alcohol problem. He battled it successfully, and he ultimately became a respected teacher and school administrator in his hometown of Kylie, Texas. You'll occasionally hear Harlan Hill's name. As I said, his name is on the trophy for the best Division II player of the year. And by the way, he also still holds the Bears record for single-game receiving yards. In 1954, he had 214. The Bears are not known for being a great passing team in their history, but still, there aren't too many guys today who still hold a team record for 60 years in the NFL. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And in closing tonight, we're going to do a little opera. Now, if you listen to this program, you'll know I'm not a big opera guy. I think the last opera star we did was Dietrich Fischer Diskow. But one of the great mezzo-sopranos in American history died recently. Reza Stevens died at the age of 99. She was the mezzo-soprano for 23 years from 1938 to 1961 at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. She made occasional forays into the movie. She sang with Nelson Eddy and Bing Crosby. She was on TV. She was on Jack Parr a lot. But again, her fame was primarily in the opera and her most famous role was as Carmen. Her father was Norwegian, and her mother was Jewish, and she was a nice down-to-earth girl from the Bronx. She was hardly your typical opera diva. She was extremely good-looking, so good-looking that she did cigarette ads for Chesterfield and for Camel. They didn't mention that in her obituaries, which I think is interesting because she was an opera singer. They airbrush that kind of stuff out these days. Anyway, in 1990, she became an honoree at the Kennedy Center in Washington. Here she is with the habanera from Bizet's Carmen. <laughs> Thank you.